Welcome again to another edition of 11th OVC. In the words of our fellow YouTuber, Ben Bomb 5 sit down, get ready, even pop some popcorn. It's time to talk about your canteens. So what makes your canteen authentic and, and which depot should you get? I'm going to start off this episode by warning you there's a lot to know, like any other aspect of a hobby, about canteens. As you can see probably through your browser window in this, in this uh, video, this is a very lengthy video. Uh, but I will guarantee you that you will learn more about uh, canteens than any other video that I've seen on YouTube. Not to say there's not out there, but at least that I've seen. So let's go ahead and let's talk about your canteens. To begin with, I must give credit where credit is due. Everything that I'm about to tell you in this video is taken off of this book, U.S. Army and Militia Canteens, 1775 to 1910 by Mike O'Donnell. Uh, this book was a wealth of information, a breath of fresh air. I wish there was a book like this on every aspect of a hobby, of every, every aspect of what we wear in Civil War reenacting. Uh, so again, I just want to make sure that uh, if you want to skip this video completely and read this book, that's what I recommend. Research for yourself. Don't take what I say for granted. Another thing to note about this video is we're going to talk specifically about the Civil War canteen. We'll leave the pre and post war canteens to someone else, so specifically this video is about Civil War era canteens. So the first step in understanding Civil War canteens is understanding the three major depots that these canteens came from. The number one, first and foremost, was the Philadelphia Depot. The second was the New York Depot. And the third one can be kind of summed up by saying the Western Depots, specifically St. Louis, but more importantly, Cincinnati as well. In the early days before the war, there's some seriously interesting ingenuity and evolution that, is, uh, that goes on on how the U.S. government decided to choose the new oblate spheroid canteens that is so synonymous with the Civil War era canteens today. Uh, originally, there was the Philadelphia, can the Philadelphia Depot was the only supplier of, of general canteens or these type of canteens. Now, in 1850s, these new spheroid canteens had a two, then three pint capacity uh, with about a half having embossed the U.S. inside of the circle. Additionally, these canteens were covered with what was described as a light blue woolen cloth that was designed to keep the tinging noise quiet on the march, uh, with what the early users noticed that it also kept it cool when wet as well. An adjustable leather strap also came with these early trial canteens, uh, and the school arsenal also put a Japan varnish on these canteens before covering it with the light blue woolen cloth. In 1853, manufacturers started using the damaged great coats for canteen covers, which is notable for very early war canteens. However, on May 1st, 1855, the last shipment of varnished or japanned uh, canteens was sent to Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. This was the last record of those canteens having that type of varnish. Most uh, of the 1857 to 61 fabric referred to as canteen cloth uh, was wool uh, cotton jean cloth purchased separately from the Utica Steam Woolen Company in Utica, New York. The famous Denmark Exchange Canteen was covered in jean cloth, dyed navy blue, and issued with an adjustable leather strap. These canteens at the time were manufactured at the Schuylkill Arsenal beginning in 1852. It is important to know some of the details of these pre-war canteens because some of these canteens were seen during the early uh, seen in use during the early part of the Civil War. But when the war broke out, there was a significant concern that the school kill uh, arsenal could not keep up with the demand that was likely and obvious to follow. Uh, much of the larger canteen contracts that were, that were awarded uh, during the summer of 1861 have uh, left decent paper trails, which was awesome for uh, Mike O'Donnell's book and of course the research to follow, that aided in knowing some of these very specific details on what we're about to cover in today's episode. So contracts that were awarded in the summer of 1861 stated that canteens should be made of tin with cork stoppers to hold three pints and weigh 11 ounces without the stopper, to have straps of cotton duct and be covered with cloth. Two noteworthy details of this early war contract include the addition of cloth shoulder straps instead of the standard uh, pre-war leather straps. Uh, these cotton straps were six foot long, folded over twice, and machine sewn along both edges. 
The closest we have to an official explanation for the switch from leather to the cloth shoulder straps appeared in a local newspaper that stated, quote, it has been necessary to substitute cotton for leather straps in the manufacture in consequence of the great diminishment of the leather supply, end quote. Another benefit of the change was a significant decrease in the overall price of these canteens, which I'm sure the government and the contractors uh, wouldn't mind as well. So in July of 1861, some small contracts of about 5,000 canteens called specifically for uncovered canteens with cloth straps. By fall of 1861, the U.S. federal government had ordered well more than 250,000 canteens uh, that were considered regulation canteens by this time. Philadelphia initially re relied heavily on the outside contractors for their supply of regulation finished canteens. And this proved to be an exception rather than the norm as you will see throughout the war. For the remainder of the war nearly all of their canteens arrived to the Philadelphia Depot bare and were finished by the depot's own employees. This practice just about cut the overall cost in half while keeping a large portion of the local women busy sewing the covers and other things as well in the depot. So now is a good opportunity to take uh, take out of a side note and talk specifically about the Pennsylvania State Canteens. Uh, Pennsylvania's wartime activities included the purchase of their own canteens to supplement their uh, their own troops for the state, uh, like many other states uh, early on in the war at that time. Uh, considering they purchased tens of thousands of identical canteens from the same tin works that supplied the Philadelphia Depot from a federal standpoint, we can consider then uh, the similar the Consider those canteens similar enough to the standard Philadelphia canteens uh, from the depot there. Although there are some differences, uh, generally speaking, they were very, very similar in construction. The Pennsylvania State canteens received their canteens already covered, while the Philadelphia Depot uh, finished most of their canteens by itself. Uh, differences between these two were probably not obvious during the first year of the war. However, once the corrugated canteens became available from the Philadelphia Depot, the State Depot canteens became a little bit more obvious, and the distinction between state canteens versus the federal uh, regulation, quote unquote, canteens. While web fabric was used most exclu exclusively to support the uh, Philadelphia Depot's corrugated canteens, the state relied heavily upon the folded, sewn uh, straps with the occasional use of leather. Nearly all of the depot's uh, 1862 to 1865 rain canteens were maker marked, while it appears that the majority of the actual state canteens remain unmarked or plain. By the end of April of 1861, Pennsylvania had raised 25 three-month regiments, largely by combining existing volunteer militia companies. While most of these militiamen arrived with their own canteens, 10 or more regiments consisted entirely of new recruits uh, had to be issued canteens and haversacks and a lot more gear. In fact, the 4th and 5th Pennsylvania regiments had to be outfit, uh, how, outfitted completely once they arrived in Washington, D.C. So now let's move on to how the canteens were covered. Uh, once the freshly minted canteens reached the Philadelphia depots, inspectors uh, examined these canteens and inspected them by submerging them in water uh, with a, a special fitting that in injected air into the canteens. Escaping bubbles meant the tin was rejected uh, and covering those tin containers with cloth has were then sewn on later uh, after they had passed that inspection. The women hired by the Philadelphia Depot who hand sewed the, the covers on the canteens hem the first half and use an overcast stitch all the way around the rim to complete it. Unlike the New York Depot contractors, no sewing machine was used in the Philadelphia Depot. During the first year of the Civil War, there was a general consistency to the Philadelphia Depot's canteen covers, which was not evident uh, from mid-1862 through the end of the war. Since first cloth covers had been applied in 1852, most of the material was acquired in a large lot specifically labeled canteen cloth. Surviving examples suggest this was either a plain woven or twilled jean cloth on a tight weave with a cotton warp and wool weft or fill. 
Prior to the Civil War, light blue had been the regulation color along with lesser amounts of gray. On July 23, 1859, General Jessup stated canteens with gray or sky blue cursey should be used. Brown became common color in 1861 and was used extensively through 1865, pretty much the whole, whole war from that context. Uh, ultimately, the color, uh, the color mattered little as it did not count against the contractors during the inspection process. And that's why you see so many different colors used on original Philadelphia Depot canteens. When the Army expanded and grew during the second half of 1862, the corresponding spike in canteen production caused the Philadelphia Depot to abandon all pretense of, of uniformity with regard to the canteen covers and their colors. And what likely began as a money-saving strategy, the Philadelphia Depot stopped ordering separate quote-unquote canteen cloth and instead began tapping into the large surplus of Army cloth uh, that had piled up. By mid-1862, the Philadelphia Depot had accumulated more than 3 million yards of army cloth, sufficient for half a million uniforms. In the third quarter of 1862, Philadelphia was ordering brown, gray, and reddish brown jean cloth from among, uh, along with the blue and uh, brown, which is basically an, an oil finished twill woven material. Uh, this embrace of uniform cloth uh, was especially apparent as a flood of cor the new corrugated canteens arrived bare in late 1862 and early 1863. The depot covered as many as 150,000 canteens in this dark blue uniform wool. And so while we're talking about this dark blue uniform wool canteen covers, uh, it's, it's pretty important and actually kind of interesting to note uh, that obviously like we talked about, early 1863 saw a great number of these canteens covered in dark uniform wool rather than the previous jean cloth. However, a smaller but still relatively substantial quantity was covered in sky blue cursey wool used from scraps from the depot's great coats as well. So as a side note, it is interesting to know, and while you uh, try to work on your impressions, it is interesting to know that both dark blue uniform were, wool, sky blue uh, cursey wool used from gray coats was put on canteens uh, in early 1863. So let's finally talk about what made Philadelphia Depot canteens unique and specific. The corrugated Philadelphia canteen. Uh, following the defeat of the Army of the Potomac at the uh, Seven Days Battle during the summer of 1862, uh, the North started to gear up for the extended war that they didn't think would happen. Uh, Pennsylvania or Philadelphia Depot greatly increased its canteen procurement activities. Uh, this corresponded with a large uh, quartermaster decision to establish a canteen reserve. Between July and September of 1862, about half a million or 500,000 canteens were ordered. Just as this production surge started, the official design of the Philadelphia Depot canteen received a dramatic change. Complaints about the early canteens uh, being easy to dent uh, was changed in July of 1862 to the famous corrugated concentric ring canteens that would be stamped for, from the Philadelphia Depot for the rest of the year for the most part, barring a few minor um, uh, can contracts early or later on in the war. Uh, therefore, after July of 1862, no new contracts formally were awarded for smooth side canteens from the Philadelphia Depot. So when you're doing your impression, uh, if you're definitely late war and your unit was issued Philadelphia canteens, chances are it had the concentric rings or corrugation on those. So this ended more than a decade tradition of the smooth-sided oblate spheroid canteen from the Philadelphia Depot. Corrugating the tin surfaces for increased resiliency was not an entirely novel idea uh, as other manufacturers and even civilian manufacturers did this already. Uh, of the three contracting depots, Philadelphia, New York, Cincinnati, or I should say the Western Theater, uh, only the Philadelphia Depot ordered these concentric ring or corrugated canteens canteens while all the others relied and kept going to their smooth sided canteens from an official regulation style concept.
So some of the complaints about the corrugated canteens was the tendency of those canteens to rush through sooner uh, than the others due to the more porous nature of the tin uh, being used for the corrugation. Uh, so while the rings made them less likely to dent, they made them more susceptible to rust and to leaking. Also, as a general rule of thumb, the number of rings on uh, the, the container itself indicated the manufacturer or the contractor who made that specific canteen. So Hayden's firm introduced what would become one of the most common corrugated designs of the war with the seven ring design. Uh, Gratz embossed his canteen halves with the distinctive five ring pa uh, pattern while Code Hopper and uh, company began making the six ring containers. By September of 1862, uh, the Horseman brothers and J.H. Uh, Rohrman had joined the fray with the delivery of identical eight ring canteens. Later on in the war, those same two firms supplied Philadelphia Depot with large quantities of matching full ring canteens, which is important to notice for the latter half of the war. Uh, next to the novelty of the rings, three other characteristics distinguish the Philadelphia Depot's mid-1862 canteens from the earlier 60, or 57 to 61 canteens. So, one of those was the narrow, uh, the narrow diameter of the spouts with small rounded lips. Uh, they were changed to larger openings and edged tops. Additionally, originally, uh, a narrow tin collar was soldered flat around the spout base. After the first year of hard campaigning, uh, frequent loss of the pewter spout uh, rec was recognized as a chronic problem for all manufacturers. Starting in the summer of 1862, an enhanced spout collar combination was required with substantial tin collar supporting uh, and also whose, whose base was firmly soldered in place, more so, though, uh, more so than the early pre-summer of 1862 canteens. So one again, another thing to note on your canteens, pre-1862 did not have the nice, solid, uh, different design uh, pewter spouse that was firmly soldered on. After 1862, good, strong pewter spouts and good, strong soldering on your canteens. Another thing to note is that even the cork stoppers were modified in 1862. The length of the original stoppers was about three inches or more of a straight walled cork and caped with or capped with a flimsy tin disc. Uh, during the summer of 1862, shorter tapered corks, about an inch and a quarter, uh, came into the picture and became the standard. Additionally, Full tin caps completely enclose the tops of all the future corks that came from the Philadelphia Depot. So now on to another famous argument of canteens, whether to go leather or whether to go cotton. After outfitting the army with about 150,000 canteens that arrived late in 1861 complete, uh, the uh, Philadelphia Depot had, has exhausted its entire complete stock. So what they did is they started finishing the additional 150,000 canteens. Despite the seemingly official switch to cloth straps during the previous summer, the Schuylkill Arsenal reverted back to the leather shoulder straps in the spring of 1862. There was no longer a shortage of leather and the seamstresses did not ha have access to the sewing machines needed or pretty much necessary to fabricate the sewn co uh, cotton straps that were in, in high volume at that point in time. So those of you doing uh, late 1862 or mid 1862 impressions, keep in mind that leather straps may not be that farby. An inventory dated March 14th of 1862 acknowledged that 17,000 canteens were on hand with leather straps. More importantly, a June report confirmed that 127,000 canteens bearing leather straps had been issued since the beginning of May of 1862. So those of you who are doing mid and late war, or sorry, mid and late 1862 impressions, leather could be your option. Surviving examples suggest the possibility that they managed to fabricate uh, or purchase the, re the normal regulation cloth shoulder straps for the first 100,000 
corrugated canteens that were ordered in July of 1862. So right there in 1862, it's important to note, uh, you know, spring and summer of 1862, 127,000 canteens had leather uh, shoulder straps. Uh, then the first order of 100,000 ring or corrugated canteens, they definitely came with the leather cloth or sewn shoulder strap. So 1862 is a big year on what you might have for a canteen. On August 1862, the military storekeeper requ requested permission to adopt one inch straps consisting of thick cotton webbing. This woven fabric was readily available to the open market and did not require folding and sewing, thus reducing the labor and the cost. So Philadelphia's use of web shoulder straps began immediately and continued uh, uninterrupted throughout the war. So again, Philadelphia Depot in August of 1862 went from the sewn, double uh, sewn uh, shoulder straps to the, the webbing shoulder straps. Initially, the most common style consisted of a bleach white cotton twill woven uh, in a herringbone type pattern. Uh, while one inch was the prescribed width, the finished products varied anywhere from uh, uh, three quarters of an inch to an inch and a half. So again, there was some variation, of course, in that manufacturing. Now, after talking about shoulder straps, another thing that you need to consider on your canteens and the authenticity of your canteen is the maker mark spouts. One of the most easily identifying marks on canteens of the mid to late war was the maker mark spouts on the Philadelphia canteen. Uh, no Philadelphia Depot canteens were maker marked prior to August, again August of 1862. This includes uh, their smooth sided containers dating back from the first obloid spheroids uh, of 1848 all the way up to 18, August of 1862. Uh, and the initial 100,000 corrugated canteens uh, ordered in July of 1862 also did not have the Maker Mark, uh, Maker Mark uh, stamped on the, on the canteen. The introduction of Maker Mark spouts followed an act of Congress of July 17, 1862 that required the marking protocol as a way of reducing fraud and identifying the sources of shoddy goods. I mean, think about if you're a, shoulder, a, a soldier in the field and you keep getting really poor quality canteens or equipment that keeps falling apart on you, you'd want to know who made that so then you could tell your higher ups and uh, fix the problem or maybe on furlough you go fix the problem yourself. Just kidding. Uh, Philadelphia responded immediately. Important to know this, because New York and definitely Cincinnati did not respond immediately. So Philadelphia Depot responded immediately to this act of Congress. Their suppliers and contractors stamped their names horizontally on the new pewter spouts. Uh, usually just below the lip included was the abbreviation Philadelphia. While only their initials were requested, some displayed their full name from the beginning. By the start of 1863, nearly all the contractors stamped their full last names onto the spouts. One notable exception to this uh, was the delivery of more than 42,000 unmarked corrugated canteens from Thomas McGill, following three contracts awarded in August and September of 1862. So McGill not actually stamping him was actually due to him not actually creating canteens, but subcontracting them from other local tin works, which was very frowned upon. The first large contract of 1863 was awarded to horsemen uh, and their new four ring, again, four ring canteens uh, instead of their older eight ring canteens. Code and Hopper signed the final contract of the war, their final contract for the war, for 7,200 canteens with their signature six ring canteen design. Hayden promised an additional 40,000 canteens and Gratz signed his last wartime contract for 3,900 canteens, both with their noted five ring canteens. On August 13, 1863, Joseph Hall signed a contract for 60,000 canteens for their famous eight ring design. Another 100,000 were ordered later on on February 16, 1864. Hall's last contract for the war was placed for 200,000 canteens. Uh, a thing to note is that in a period of just seven months, Philadelphia Depot alone purchased 360,000 uh, 360, canteens 
from just Rohrman, let alone the other contractors. Now, consequently, Rohrman's four ring canteens are one of the two most common associated with the Army of the Potomac in late 1864 and 1865. So for you, uh, Union reenactors or federal reenactors, late war, or eastern on the on the eastern side of things. If you have Rohrman's four ring canteens, uh, definitely nug for that time period. Another design frequently recovered in the late war sites is a seven ring canteen with its spout marked Hayden, Porter, and Booth. Uh, from Philadelphia. Uh, on January 7th, 1864, the Metalworking Partnership of John Hayden, Christopher Porter, and George Booth was engaged to supply 100,000 canteens at a rate of 1,000 canteens per day. That's a rate for sure. A second contract in May of 1864 requested 55,000 canteens. Hayden's last contract was signed in August 1864 for 120,000 regulations style canteens. By the end of 1864, contractor markings had been expanded to require the, uh, and display the contract date along with the name. With the war almost over, this requirement only applied to 150,000 canteens from Rohrman in December of 1864 with his obvious four ring design. Also interesting to note is that the, the Philadelphia Depot ordered 5,000 mounted canteen corks. I have no idea what that is. Uh, those of you in internet land or YouTube land, if you know what a mounted canteen cork is, please let me know in my minor research. I cannot find anything specific on what exactly a mounted canteen, canteen cork is. So please help me out with that. So after that Rohrman order, uh, according to the annual report of the Quartermaster General, a grand total of 1,163,347 canteens were ordered just during the last year of the war alone. Records indicate that these canteens were issued uh, to the post-war army uh, with different covers, obviously, all the way up until 1898, basically two years from the 1900s our soldiers were still using the Philadelphia Depot Canteen. So that's the basics of the Philadelphia Depot Canteen. So let's sum up the Philadelphia Depot Canteen. So with all that said, uh, you, can be, you can sum up in just a few points of the Philadelphia Depot Canteen. Uh, number one, when the war began, the Philadelphia Depot was generally or was considered the sole source of Army canteens for the U.S. Army. When New York and other depots ordered their own canteens in 1861, they generally copied the Philadelphia Depot's initial design because originally they were the only recognized or regulation depot in that area at the time. So number two, considering rings and other markings, uh, that during the summer of 1862, the Philadelphia Depot introduced a radical new corrugated canteen that is a unique, uh, I guess, unique to that depot. Uh, the rings range from four to eight rings, and additionally, the spouts were enlarged and reinforced to include the upraised lips and the full-size spouts. Contractors to the Philadelphia Depot began marking their names uh, on the spout itself in August of 1862. Number three, considering the covers. Philadelphia employed large amounts of plain woven jean cloth until about 1861, which is still relatively early in the war. Afterwards, twill jean became commonplace, uh, followed by a wide variety of fabrics during the second half of 1862. Beginning uh, that fall, the depot made extensive use of the dark blue uniform wool, along with less, lesser amounts of genuine kersey wool uh, from their great coats. Many of their covers were pieced together from scraps during the 1864-1865 period, and the seams were consistently overcast stitch all the way around the rims. They were never machine sewn, unlike the other depots. Uh, so that's one thing to note on the cover side of things with the Philadelphia Depot. Number four and the last major item to note were the shoulder straps. All shoulder straps prior to June of 1861 were leather. About 150,000 were ordered from the contractors complete with cotton duck straps during the summer of 1861. Another 150,000 issued during early 1862, again, had leather straps supplied by the depot. Cotton or lined web straps became the standard in August of 1862 and were issued continuously until the end of the war through 1865. So that being said, 
That is, like I said, the basics of the Philadelphia Depot Canteen. There's a lot more to it than that, but that's what I can sum it up in a relatively concise manner. So with the Philadelphia Depot, there's what you have. So now after we talked all about the Philadelphia Depot, let's talk about the second biggest or second most important manufacturer depot during the uh, Civil War, which is the New York Depot. Next to Philadelphia, the city of New York was a primary center of canteen production during the Civil War. During the chaotic spring of 1861, the normal supply system was overwhelmed with urgent requests from the states uh, for four canteens, haversacks, and many other items. So New York is the second biggest thing to know when it comes to Eastern War production of Civil War canteens. So on May 1st, 1861, Secretary of War Cameron sent a letter to the northern states basically making each state equip their own volunteers early on in the war. Therefore, for nearly the first year of the war, individual states would have to make up their own arrangements in supplying their own troops. New York State was ahead of the game when it came to this. Weeks earlier, contracts had been awarded already to Mr. Bell for 33,000 regulation style canteens to outfit their first 38 new regiments. But by May 29th, 1861, the New York State Arsenal had 28,000 canteens on hand. And by July 23rd, 1861, uh, 18,691 canteens had already been issued to their own troops. Hardly a month after the start of the war, and with the New York Depot's office and clothing and equipage not yet in operation, the state had already ordered more than 75,000 canteens uh, to outfit their own troops at that time. One thing important to note about this, already all by that time had the iron stopper chains and leather shoulder straps. So then by October of 1861, the practice of, of each state supplying their own regiments ended and the federal government formally took over. The uniform regiments of the pre-war New York State Militia had been uh, fairly well equipped with canteens in 1861. Unique to note though, New York State Militias primarily had the 10 drum canteen design. There were notable exceptions like the elite 7th New York with, which carried the, uh, sphere, the oblate spheroid canteens purchased in the early 1850s. These early 1850s canteens that were issued to the uh, early New York regiments uh, were the uh, original two-pint version ordered by the Army prior to 1853 with the leather straps, but no cloth covers or stopper cords. So for those of you uh, reenacting uh, early New York regiments, this is important to know. The New York Times reported that in their haste to furnish some of the first regiments leaving for Virginia in 1861, a quantity of rubber canteens was issued without thorough inspection and within a few hours the water became completely unfit for drinking or unbearable. As a side note to these uh, rubber canteens, I strongly urge you to read about the rubber bladder type canteens and how they actually came about. It is definitely an interesting and entertaining read to say the least. Uh, however, going back here, uh, in June of 1861, Colonel David Vinton established the branch of the Quartermaster's Office of Clothing and Equipage at the New York Arsenal, formally creating the New York Depot. This depot's first formal canteen contract was awarded in July 8th of 1861 to our, uh, Barlow May, I think, Barlow May and Garrett of New York for 1,010 canteens. The depot then posted advertisements for more contracts on July 17th of 1861 for about 200,000 additional canteens. This is probable, uh, or it is probable that some of these were uh, furnished by the same contractors that were originally beginning to supply the Philadelphia Depot. If this is true, and the reason people think this is because it explains a lot of the similarities issued uh, by the two contracting depots early on in the first year of the war between New York in Philadelphia, there's a lot of similar consistencies between those, two, between those two depots, so it is important to note those similarities. 
So after that, an, an additional contract was signed in August, of, uh, August 19th of 1861 for an additional 100,000 canteens, specifically, and what's unique about this, with the first cloth straps. For the New York Depot, this marked the first appearance of sewn cotton straps, not the webbing, but the folded over twice, sewn on both edges, uh, cotton straps. Uh, they were six foot long and made four layers, and like I said, machine sewn on both edges. Again, as a rule of thumb, uh, all 1857 pattern canteens purchased by the government before the war had the uh, famous adjustable shoulder strap. Now, specifically going back to New York, this uh, 100,000 canteen order of August 19th specifically stated to switch from the leather over to the double or uh, folded over and sewn cloth straps. So little is actually currently known about the New York 1861 stoppers because few intact examples survive today. Uh, apparently some were direct copies of the Philadelphia Depot stoppers which were about three inches long with 10 discs on top of about a one and a one one inch and th one and three quarter inch cork secured by round screw nuts with slots. A particular style of screw nut has been associated with early New York canteens as a round iron disc accompanied by a tin washer. Because New York was strictly a contracting and distribution depot with no in-house manufacturing, its contractors were required to deliver canteens fully completed and fully furnished with shoulder straps already in place with the covers. Uh, this requirement made the New York inspection process an awkward two-step process. They first conducted an underwater air pressure test like the Philadelphia Depot and made, made sure there was no escaping bu uh, bubbles. Then they would send those uh, past canteens back to the contractors who would then uh, finish them with shoulder straps and covers and then send them back. Uh, for you, uh, those of you who are really uh, involved with creating boxes and wooden uh, containers, uh, it's, it's important to notice and interesting to notice that uh, once they boxed up, the boxes contained 200 canteens per package and it was about 40 inches long 31 inches wide and 34 inches deep doesn't seem big enough to hold 200 canteens uh, but that's what the uh, the contractor specified so interesting now again 31 inches wide 40 inches long and 34 inches deep held 200 canteens that were then shipped complete to the new york depot one of the major differences between the Philadelphia canteens and the New York Depot canteens uh, was the stitching of those woolen covers when they were finished. The New York covers were stitched in a very consistent manner throughout the war. Starting with a pre-cut die or pre-cut halves, they were placed face to face, uh, then machine sewn along the, the lower uh, two thirds. Uh, and then after that, fit into the canteen and overcast stitch up on top to complete the cover. So, which is unique from the Philadelphia Depot, which was was completely uh, hand stitch and overcast stitch all the way around. The material covering the New York canteens from 1861 to 1862 generally consisted of sturdy jean cloth, which is a plain woven fabric with cotton warp and wool weft pattern, uh, which patterned after Philadelphia Depot's canteen covers as well. Uh, a sizable percentage of New York mid-war canteens were made with a light blue jean cloth, which is important again uh, for you guys uh, reenacting the New York uh, state or that kind of 1862 to uh, late 1861 era, uh, little light jean cloth, light blue jean cloth would be good for you. The same material uh, that this light blue jean cloth is important to know that it was the same material they used for enlisted trousers at that time as well. Uh, so again, using those scraps that were easily available to those contractors. So New York's choice of this blue uniform cloth in 1863 was probably inspired by the widespread use of blue uniform material used by the Philadelphia Depot at that time as we uh, discussed previous in the Philadelphia Depot. Uh, by late 1863, early 1864, the Philadelphia Depot began uh, dipping heavy into its scrap pile to cover its canteens, while the New York suppliers turned to a different source. Between early 1864 and the final contracts of 1865, nearly all of, New of the New York Depot canteens were covered in a unique shoddy woolen cloth. Always plain woven and colored gray, it's the cover that is most frequently encountered today for surviving examples of the New York Depot canteen.
So with all this talk about the covers, I would like to again squash, well maybe not squash, but take care of some rumors and misunderstandings out there about the intent or the purpose of these covers. As we did, as we talked about previously in the Philadelphia, uh, Philadelphia Depot era, uh, while it is, you know, some say, well, the canteen covers are there to reduce the noise. And others say, well, the canteen covers, the reason they did it is because it uh, keeps it cool when it's wet and that uh, the evaporation. Well, actually both are true. Uh, one of the uh, comments of a uh, old veteran said, quote, a good soldier, scout, or hunter will, during hot weather, dip his canteen whenever the opportunity offers, thus keeping its contents cool. But also, we have uh, other contracts, or I'm sorry, other uh, written examples of quartermaster agents early on when they were researching this stuff, saying that a lot of the reason why they put tin covers on when they weren't originally is to keep the noise down from the tinging and the banging, especially on campaign. So now let's finally talk about what made the New York Depot so famous and easily recognizable, which is the iron stopper chains. By the summer of 1862, obvious design differences began to separate the New York Depot from the Philadelphia Depot, uh, and a distinctive uh, style emerged for the New York Depot. At last, the sturdy stopper chains completely replaced the twine cords. The exact timing and the circumstances of the change have yet to really be determined, although the New York Depot received shipments of stopper chains in 1861 and 1862, it cannot be proven that iron chains were exclusively used until mid or the summer of 1862. So in addition to the iron stopper chains that we previously talked about, additional characteristics of the New York Depot's 1862 pattern uh, included those stoppers with domed caps on top of the corks and shaped rectangular screw nuts uh, that were threaded into the cork wires below. By the second half of 1862, a decision had been made to indent the spout bases so they would fit tightly inside the tin collars. Only the New York Depot took this extra precaution to make these canteens more sturdy. Additionally, the New York Depot had enlarged and flattened spout lips, uh, which are immediately recognizable as New York. Although canteens with small uh, spout lips continued to be issued in 1862, the wider lips had become a standard by the end of 1862. Sometime around the end of 1862, the domed uh, tin stopper caps yielded to a uh, full tin caps completely enclosing the top of every cork. A majority of New York screw nuts consisted of the non-corrosive brass from 1862 then to the end of the war. So again, those are important, uh, important things to notice as far as the dome cap to then the, the full, just full cap, uh, and then the uh, screw nuts on the bottom as well, which were rectangular for New York. So now after talking about some of the design distinguishing features of the New York Depot, uh, let's talk about the primary canteen uh, contractors for New York. Uh, for practical financial reasons, a majority of New York canteens were contracted to uh, basically two major firms. By August of 1864, uh, Albert Jewett and Company had been contracted to provide New York with at least 790,000 canteens, while John Anderson had supplied another 510,000 uh, canteens as well. From the beginning, these two contractors had demonstrated an ability to deliver quality in a time timely manner. Now on an interesting side note, another value of these two contractors was their willingness to accept government vouchers or basically IOUs in lieu of direct payment. Uh, Jewett and Company was the largest producer of army canteens in United States history. It is credited with manufacturing more than a million canteens during the war. And as you will see when we cover the Cincinnati Depot canteens, Jewett was involved with contracting with them as well. Jewett's recognized and nation nationwide reach became apparent when he was contracted separately to out, out, uh, outfit, like I said, the quartermaster uh, office in, in St. Louis and in Cincinnati with a total of about 162,000 canteens with those stubby, flat-spouted lips with jean cloth covers. Uh, the entire 45,000 sent to St. Louis had leather shoulder straps, while the 117,000 sent, sent to Cincinnati had the uh, sewn cotton folded shoulder straps for them. 
So although not specifically recorded, it is likely that both St. Louis and Cincinnati received canteens equipped from the infamous iron, uh, with the infamous iron stopper chains. Again, it's not documented, but given the, uh, the timing and the price per canteen, uh, it is likely that those Western depots received Jewett's uh, iron stopper chains, which is important to know for, uh, for us Western reenactors. Now, large-scale canteen production resumed in the spring of 1863. On March uh, 23rd, 1863, Albert Jewett and company agreed to make an additional 100,000 canteens uh, for that new year. The contract is interesting because it's believed that, it, th that this 1863 order came with the more expensive leather shoulder straps due to the higher cost on the paperwork. So then finally, Jewett signed his final New York contract on August 12th of 1864 for 200,000 canteens for the New York Depot. Uh, this order uh, came after the mandate for contractors to mark their canteens. However, where Philadelphia responded immediately with their contractors to the mandate, and even Cincinnati followed suit soon after, uh, New York's first shipment of Maker Mark canteens did not arrive until late 1864. So it is important for if you if you are saying you want a, uh, a New York style canteen for your impression, uh, notice how it ideally should not have a Maker Mark stamp unless you're doing super late war, uh, last quarter of 1864, and of course 1865 would be okay. Before that, not so much. So unlike the other two depots, New York contractors did not include the locations of their company names, which is kind of interesting. Uh, the last 200,000 canteens delivered by Jewett displayed his a Jewett logo struck vertically on the pewter spouts. It is by far the most common New York maker mark spout found on canteens today. So finally, let's talk about the last contracts later on in the war. Uh, canteen marking reached its peak at the New York Depot uh, when a final series of contracts were signed and awarded on February 4th of 1865. The largest went to John Johnson of New York for 100,000 canteens, and Johnson stamped his full company name uh, and contract date vertically into every pewter spout. Interesting to note. Uh, they were also accompanied by cotton drill straps and shoddy gray colored covers. So we cannot, of course, talk about New York canteens without mentioning the infamous uh, Inspector T.F. Bales, who named, whose name started to appear on cotton shoulder straps later in the war. Several months before any of the New York canteens were make or marked in late 1864, the approval stamp of the government's hardware inspector, which is Theodore F. Bales, began to appear on the shoulder straps coming through his depot. His three-line mark was first applied to the Albert Jewett's February 23, 1864 contract for his 75,000 canteens, followed by the May 1864 uh, Johnson or John Anderson contract for his 250,000 canteens. An estimation of surviving examples confirms that the cloth straps of many include the T.F. Bales Inspector mark. So again, as reenactors trying to uh, step up the authenticity, you know these are Inspector marks that we should be looking for on late war canteens in our impression. Uh, Bales began marking every shoulder strap upon arrival of the Jewett's, uh, of Jewett's final 1864 order for his 200,000 canteens and of course continued on through the end of the war. The Bales mark is the most frequently encountered inspection stamp or marking of any kind on shoulder straps of all Civil War canteens known today. So again, another thing to note for our reenacting hobby. So with all of that, let's sum up the New York Depot canteens. Of the three government depots contracting for large quantities of regulation canteens during the Civil War, those issued by the New York Depot are notable for the high production quality standards. Nearly all of their canteens were issued with the highest quality tin, which included high quality imported materials. The most obvious attribute of the New York canteens is without a doubt the iron stopper chains used to secure the corks. Exactly when and under what circumstances the idea originated has not been fully answered, but it is represented and considerable improvement over the retaining cores employed by pretty much all the other two depots. It appears that they did not fully adopt the chain, however, until mid-1862. 
And then by the second half of 1862, the New York Depot had developed its own distinctive style that allows us to immediately recognize them even today. Aside from the chains, they had finely shaped pewter spouts with wide flat lips, recessed bases designed to fit tightly into those tin collars. Only New York put domed tin caps on their corks and rectangular screw nuts underneath without the benefit of a washer. All New York covers were neatly applied by the contractors, which was partially machine sewn and finished with an overcast stitch. Based on known examples of the covers of 1861 and 1862, primarily consisted of, of the plain woven jean cloth of gray or brown color. Light blue twill jean cloth was put on several hundred thousand canteens in 1863. Afterwards, New York settled on plain woven fabric with a, a thin cotton warp and thick wool weft, which included much processed or uh, much reprocessed wool. So this shoddy gray material apparently covered all of their 1864 and 1865 canteens and is by far the most common style found today. New York shoulder straps consisted of twilled cotton uh, folded fabric, which are folded over twice and double, stu double stitch with a machine sewer. Leather straps accompanied the New York State canteens ordered during the first months of the war and limited numbers of leather shoulder straps were pro produced later on in the war for states and those other Western deep pose we previously talked about. For the most part, uh, cloth straps were the standard for the New York Depot. Another thing to keep in mind is no New York canteens were maker marked before August of 1864. Altogether, a total of 30 or 366,000 New York canteens displayed the names of the makers. A sizable percentage of the depot's 64 and 65 straps also bear the TF Bells and Spectre mark. And for now, those are the high points of the New York Depot canteen. Again, we've covered Philadelphia, now we've covered uh, New York. Now let's go on to the Cincinnati and St. Louis and other Western depots to finish out our canteen episode. So now let's go ahead and talk finally about the Western Depot Canteen, specifically referring to the Cincinnati and St. Louis arsenals or depots. Active military operations began in Cincinnati, Ohio during May of 1861 for many reasons, one of which was due to the strategic location along the, uh, the, the rivers, the Ohio rivers uh, bordering Kentucky. A large force of militiamen gathered there from nearby states uh, from the old uh, Northwest territories in anticipation of launching a, a great offensive in the western part of the war. So on July 1st, uh, General William Nelson was ordered to march his command into eastern Tennessee and liberate uh, eastern Tennessee or the region. Canteens and of course a lot of other equipment would be needed for several regiments that he was expected to raise and equip to go into that region. On July 16th, 1861, Nelson notified the Adjutant General in Washington the following. He said, quote, I have I've directed the purchase of 5,000 haversacks, 5,000 knapsacks, and canteens, end quote. Thus, this was the uh, first uh, canteen order originating in Cincinnati and the only known contract awarded before August of 1862 uh, when it comes to the Cincinnati, or Cincinnati Depot or the, the Western Territories. Also, during the opening months of the war in the West, uh, no quartermaster uh, depot found itself in a more precarious position than the one located at the arsenal in St. Louis. Uh, with the Mississippi River closed to the lucrative southern trade all of a sudden, the local economy was severely depressed. Uh, meanwhile, the city streets were filling up with raw recruits eager to do something. Uh, many, most actually, without arms, without knapsacks, without equipment, without canteens, which were not a available from the public stores. So in response to this, the local tinsmiths had, uh, that had made thousands of canteens during the Mexican War, they stepped up and were willing to make more now in this dire need for the North in the West. Uh, however, the possibility was delayed due to suspicions and suspicious behavior on the exact loyalty of these tinsmiths, uh, whether you know they were for the you know, Southern uh, hearted or, or for the North. Additionally, the quartermaster in St. Louis did not even have the funds nor the credit to do so 
even if they wanted to. After Lincoln's call of 75,000 troops, and the, the St. Louis, uh, St. Louis Depot reported they had no clothing, no equipment, no camp or garrison equipment for their troops to be had on hand. So of course this shortage was, was no really surprise as the St. Louis Depot or the St. Louis Arsenal was no true clothing and equipment depot, but rather a, a point of transfer uh, of, of storage and transfer to other, other troops and other equipment uh, out west. Uh, by June 30th, 1861, the quartermaster in St. Louis reported that they'd only purchased and only uh, basically contracted 4,000 canteens. By this time, to keep this in, in perspective of the other depots, uh, by this time the Pennsylvania and New York depots had collectively already ordered 53,000 canteens. So while the East had already ordered 53,000 canteens, the same time St. Louis had only ordered 4,000. So then on July 1st, 1861, Child Pratt and Fox was contracted to furnish uh, the first major, uh, I guess, supply of canteens, both covered and uncovered. The depot had recently opened a sewing hall employing seamstress, uh, seamstresses that happened to be the wives and daughters of the volunteers that had just joined the service. This entire shipment of canteens almost certainly exceeded about 10,000 uh, and was the first major uh, order that St. Louis did, and it was a local order for local tinsmiths. So then later in July of 1861, the Department of the West was ordered to supply an additional 5,000 canteens as soon as possible due to the buildup of the war effort. The contractor selected was asked to first visit the New York Depot, acquire samples of their regulation canteens. This is important to note for our Western, especially on the St. Louis aspect of the St. Louis canteens, important for a reenactor perspective because it makes sense why a lot of those canteens had a lot of similarities to New York canteens. Why? Because the guy making them was asked to go to New York and basically model his canteens after New York. Uh, on August 19th, 1861, a middleman deal was accepted to supply uh, the Western Depot with 15,000 canteens, uh, half, made in, sorry, half made in Chicago and half made in St. Louis at this time. So this contract specified that the canteen would resemble canteens uh, made by the Philadelphia Depot, which is unique because the previous canteen, or previous order of 5,000 canteens, was asked to model the New York Depot. Again, pretty interesting on the Western canteens. Uh, say, uh, staying in the Western tradition and going against all government contract regulations, uh, St. Louis requisitioned uh, 5,000 canteens from the middleman Livingston Bell & Company on September 2nd, 1861. So one interesting note on how hard up the St. Louis Arsenal or the depot was uh, is the fact that uh, Congress charged Major McKinstry in St. Louis for buying those 15,000 canteens on the open market for 60 cents when the contract canteens were generally only about 35, 36 and a half cents each, thus grossly squandering the public funds, or at least that was his charge. He was arrested on no, in November, confined without due process, and discharged in January of 1863. To this day, no known examples of this early war uh, acquisition, if you will, uh, have been identified or are known to exist. But that's how hard up St. Louis was in acquiring this. They needed to get these canteens as soon as possible, uh, but did not have very many means to do so. So in the absence of experienced leadership in an immature manufacturing base, uh, it significantly reduced the ability of these Western states to properly equip their volunteers during the first buildup of the, of the war. Uh, therefore, local militias, quartermasters, and other basically self-appointed suppliers exhausted all available resources and, and incentivized, for really incentivized local tinsmiths into hurriedly making and fashioning new canteens. Whether you can call these early war canteens in the West regulation canteens or not, uh, you, you know, maybe not, but they did what they could in the West to get their boys canteens.
So specifically talking about the Ohio state militias now, uh, the, the state arsenal of Ohio was practically empty in April of 1861. The first two regiments in Ohio were sent into the field without weapons or equipment, while several of the new 90-day volunteer regiments were forced to remain at home for lack of canteens, haversacks, and other necessary items. Recognizing this significant issue, Governor Dennison proved to be resourceful and contracted a number of firms in Ohio and surrounded surrounding states for the canteens and other items that were necessary to equip these first regiments. While these were uh, being made, many early Ohio regiments were issued ob uh, basically obsolete rubber bag canteens, uh, commercial tin drum canteens, and many more awkward non-regulation variants of canteens. In a relatively short time, Ohio acquired 15,378 uh, canteens from local contractors to supply their first few regiments. Uh, while campaigning with McClellan in, the western, uh, in western Virginia, uh, uh, the 10th Ohio reported receiving their first actual regulation canteens in July, on July 4th of 1861. So again, for you early war uh, reenactors, or if you're, especially on this Ohio basis, guys, if you are impersonating an early Ohio regiment, uh, basically from the start of the war up until July of 1861, uh, again, maybe you can... Uh, accent your uh, your impression by having a non-regulation canteen, having a tin drum canteen, or if someone out there wants to make the uh, rubber bladder or rubber bag canteens, go ahead and, and uh, do that as well. But it is interesting to note because there's a lot of Ohio-based reenacting organizations out there, so uh, keep that in mind. So after talking about the, what the state of Ohio did, let's go to the state of Illinois in the early part of the war. Illinois, uh, with its wealth and population, ranked fourth in the nation. Uh, it was obviously far better in, uh, in far better shape than its neighbors in supplying its, its regiments. Between, 18, uh, between April of 1861 and July of 1862, the state purchased themselves 54,740 canteens for its recruits. In August of 1861, William Teft of Detroit was contracted to supply 3,000 canteens canteens to the 5th, 6th, and 7th Michigan Infantry Regiments. So again, while uh, Illinois had its own regiments, there was a local uh, tinsmith in Illinois that was able to not only supply some of the Illinois regiments, but then also supply the 5th, 6th, and 7th Michigan Regiments as well. Now, uh, Iowa, on the other hand, had absolutely no formal organized militia system, or at least anything that looked like the other states. Uh, they managed to acquire canteens locally for its second and third regiments. On May 15th of 1861, Iowa purchased 5,000 canteens additionally to support the other uh, creating or other ongoing regiments that were being formed at that point in time. Uh, but after that, Iowa pretty much relied on the other depots to supply their later regiments uh, because Iowa, for the most part, had no organized system. So then we go on to Wisconsin. Uh, Wisconsin ordered a sufficient quantity of tin drum canteens during the summer and fall of 1861 to equip its first 16 regiments. And after that, uh, they relied on the federal depots to, uh, to then outfit them. Now, in my brief research, I was not able to figure out whether they had the, uh, the built up Cincinnati Depot canteen or one of the Eastern Depot canteens, but specifically for the early part of the state of Wisconsin, they came up, they, they got uh, the first 16 regiments um, supplied with their own canteens, uh, and then after that, the, the other federal depots took over. So that is Wisconsin. So with all this being said, it is important to know that during the first year of the war, only two formal quartermaster contracts are known to be let or awarded for contract or regulation canteen, uh, canteens outside of, of New York and Philadelphia. On August 28, 1861, the small state depot in Indianapolis signed the first contract for a contractor or regulation canteen uh, actually made in the West. Local stove and tin merchant uh, Livingston and Gold, or sorry, Livingston Goldsberry agreed to provide the state with 10,000 regulation canteens. This was the first known formal contract for Western canteens outside of New York and Philadelphia. 
So then that contract is followed up by another contract on September 12th of 1861 for an additional 10,000 canteens with Jacob Vogtel. A second formal contract was uh, awarded uh, by the Indianapolis Depot on August 15th of 1862 with Jacob Vogtel uh, for an additional 10,000 canteens. This contract specified that leather straps would be put on these canteens. So again, for you Indianapolis Depot guys or anyone around the Indianapolis area, uh, you can tell by, or you can relatively uh, know by, uh, you know, up to August of 1862, you could argue that your, can your canteen straps could or arguably have those leather straps on them. So going back to St. Louis after going around all the western states, on July 22nd of 1862, St. Louis formally advertised and contracted 45,000 canteens. This was probably their first and only formal canteen contract awarded in accordance with actual army regulations. All the other canteens they got happened to be acquired through other means. On August 9th, 1862, St. Louis ordered additional 45,000 canteens with those leather straps, which was uh, provided by New York contractor Albert Jewett and Company. Again, previously we talked about Jewett, and here he is again showing up for St. Louis. So these Jewett 1862 canteens were similar to those that he was making for the New York Depot with, of course, the flat lips, the full-size spouts, and metal stopper chains. Again, metal stopper chains for this uh, Western order. Uh, this, these would, again, have the dome tin caps and top uh, and rectangular screw nuts on, on the bottom. The issue of leather straps reflects the influence of the Philadelphia Depot, which had recently issued about 150,000 uh, canteens with those leather straps during the spring and summer of 1862 like we had previously talked about during the Philadelphia Depot. So for the most part, that's about it when it comes to St. Louis. And for now, we're gonna go back to the Cincinnati Depot and spend a lot of time with the Cincinnati Depot and how they pretty much took over in the West. Uh, supply officers at the Cincinnati Depot were instructed to acquire their own regulation tank canteens by mid-1862, meaning they needed to get up to speed and start ordering and contracting uh, canteens like Philadelphia and New York. Their first contract for 42,000 canteens was secured on August 4th, 1862, again by none other than Jewett from New York. September 1st, 1862, the Cincinnati Depot ordered again another 25,000 uh, canteens, regulation canteens, again from Jewett and Company. So then on December 8th, 1862, another 50,000 can uh, canteens were ordered again from Jewett and Company. Altogether, Cincinnati ordered 117,000 regulation canteens from Jewett and Company during the second half of 1862 alone. This means that Cincinnati canteens were almost identical to the New York Depot canteens during this time frame because the same contractor was making both regulation canteens. So to supplement Jewett and Company's canteens, on September 1st, 1862, Cincinnati contracted Winchell Marsh and Company to provide an additional 50,000 canteens. They then closed out the year with another order of 25,000 canteens on October 13th of 1862. One thing to note about uh, Winchell Marsh and Company is that early on in the year, they were notorious and famous for a faulty and a horrible soldering jobs and loose pewter spouts on their canteens, which probably was the reason uh, maker mark spouts were required later on in the war. So finally, let's talk about what made Cincinnati Depot famous. Like New York, Cincinnati has a very distinctive look and feel. Uh, New York has, or they're famous for their 10 stopper chains. Cincinnati is famous for their 10 spout, uh, 10 spout canteens versus the pewter spouts. Cincinnati profoundly altered the design of this pattern of the regulation pattern canteen when it actually, in the next series of contracts awarded in the spring of 1863, they actually went from the normal pewter spout to the tin spouts that were specified pretty much everywhere else. Uh, they actually had four contracts that were awarded in April of 1863 that specifically asked for these distinctive tin spouts. So while there's still some argument on exactly why there was an intentional change from the normal 
well, very common pewter spouts to the tin spouts. Nothing is super clear, but either way, it doesn't really matter. There was no shortage of pewter at the time, and the cost difference was about the same, but for whatever reason, this made the Cincinnati Depot very distinctive, which for us reenactors, very important to notice if you want a Cincinnati Depot canteen. Purchases of this new tin spout canteens began on April 6th, 1863 with Winchell, March, Mar Winchell Marsh and Company, and they agreed to deliver 30,000 canteens. One week later, they signed a second contract for 25,000 additional canteens, again with this new tin spout added on. So then on April 13th, 1863, Evans and Hassel of Philadelphia promised the Cincinnati Depot 25,000 regulation canteens, again with the 10 spouts. All these contracts specified plain canteens, which actually was probably in response to the recent change that Philadelphia had on the corrugated or ringed canteens coming out of that depot. On April 20th, 1863, uh, again, Jew and Company was contracted to supply an additional 40,000 Cincinnati Depot canteens with now their famous 10 spouts. So that last Jew and Company contract was actually the last time that Cincinnati used any Eastern contractors. From this point forward, after July of 1863, they started using, or they completely started using, uh, only using Western, uh, can Western tinsmiths. The second cluster of Cincinnati canteens began in that July of 1863. Winchell Marsh and Company again was awarded a contract for 20,000 canteens at a supply rate of 10,000 per week. That's more than a thousand canteens per day pretty fast. A larger contract was awarded to Oliver Holden for an additional 80,000 canteens. Again, by this point, obviously had the tin spout for the Cincinnati Depot. So a small but significant uh, number of uh, Indianapolis canteens actually were noted to have the gutta percha or rubber shoulder straps uh, that were added uh, as issue, maybe for some elite units, maybe for some officers, uh, but there were about 3,100 canteens with gutta percha shoulder straps that were ordered out of the Indianapolis uh, style depot. So now let's talk about Maker Mark spouts for the Western depots. Although Maker Mark spouts were required in July of 1862 from an act of Congress, uh, the Western contractors were not formally even notified about this rule until July 21st of 1863. It was in this wake of the new rule for Western contractors that a sizable percentage of Cincinnati's cloth shoulder straps began identifying the makers. The famous 1864 Winchell Martian Company stamp was actually an upgrade and significant difference from their first wave of Maker Mark stamps. Their 1863 stamps began with GEO period D period and does not include the contract date or Spencer's inspection stamp, both of which are identified or found on their 1864 variants or their 1864 stamps. So now let's talk about the Cincinnati Depot's canteens of 1864. On April 16, 1864, it proved to be the start of canteen contracts for that year, at least in the West. Cincinnati uh, went direct to uh, Holden, Holden Shade Morris and Company to produce 120,000 canteens at a rate of 1,500 canteens per day. One month later, a second contract specified 150,000 canteens for the same Holden Shade, uh, Holden Shade Morris and Company contracts. So the Cincinnati Depot awarded its last and largest contract on June 20th, hey, my birthday, uh, June 20th, 1864, to Winchell Marsh and Company for 300,000 canteens at a rate of 12,000 per week. This order is the most common relic found today uh, for Civil War uh, canteen collectors and, and uh, relic hunters, okay? Uh, several distinctive features of Winchell's final shipment help nail down their origin. So first, their tin spouts were a little larger than those of other suppliers with well-rounded lips. Stoppers accompanying this last shipment included one-inch corks, which were considerably shorter 
And then the previous inch and corridor, even an inch and a half, Army Standard with the unique convex tin washers under the square uh, iron screw nuts. Most were covered in a shoddy twilled fabric exhibiting a, a checkered board or kind of a hound's tooth appearance caused by the weaving uh, of the white cotton threads through the dark uh, brown or dark wool yarn. A handful have been noted dyed blue, but that uh, is, is rare as most of them are known or be seen to be dyed brown. Additionally, sewn cotton or linen shoulder straps accompanied uh, these last 300,000 Cincinnati Depot canteens uh, that had the plain, you know, uh, woven duct fabric uh, seen on early, uh, nearly all of Cincinnati Depot's later war canteens. Most were double stitched with discolored or even brown uh, thread, unlike any other regulation canteen straps that were available in the country at the time. So particularly noteworthy are the three separate black ink marks on Winchell's 1864 straps. In accordance with the quartermaster's uh, latest identification requirements, those furnished by Winchell Marsh and Company feature the firm's full name, Winchell Marsh and Co., without the previous GEOD prefix that appeared on their 1863 straps. And also stamped separately was a three-line approval mark by Cincinnati's hardware inspector, A.G. Spencer, who began this canteen mark in, in August of 1864. Spencer's official endorsement also appeared on a limited number of cloth shoulder straps from the Holden Shades two contracts that were signed earlier in 1864. And then lastly, a third and more important stamp seen on Winchell's final 300 uh, canteen straps was the June 20th, 1864 contract date. Today, it is impossible to determine the full extent of this marking on account of the scarcity uh, of intact examples and the poor condition, uh, for, poor condition of surviving examples today. Uh, constantly dipped in the water and subjected to the elements, the thin woven cotton linen fabric shriveled quickly uh, and the lettering faded pretty pretty bad quickly. Uh, it's no different than our canteens today. Uh, you know, it doesn't take much campaigning for these canteens to go bad. I know uh, I tend to go through, you know, one or two canteens. Well, about one canteen a year is what I go through to where it gets destroyed, not just recovered, but dented, ding, smashed, gouged, cut. Uh, you know, so it's no different than those guys uh, back then as well. So the famous tin spouts was definitely official in April of 1863, and after that, all major contracts awarded uh, by the Cincinnati Depot had the famous tin spout canteens. So our knowledge of the uh, Cincinnati Depot canteens definitely uh, increased in our ability to research them once the maker marks were required after the second half of 1863. This learning process, uh, this learning process is the research was actually made easier because out of, uh, out of that late 1863 order and on throughout the rest of the war, only three major different suppliers supplied the 950,000 canteens that were ordered with those 10 spouts. So we we kind of narrow all those Cincinnati Depot canteens in the later part of the war to basically, uh, you know, three major manufacturers, which makes it easy to recognize them and to research them. So all known Cincinnati style canteens have, uh, have obviously the stoppers with the distinctive square iron screw nuts holding the corks. Uh, about one third including the unique convex tin washers. Uh, the cover material is almost always coarser than that of the eastern counterparts with the bottom sewn on the inside like the New York's or machine sewn, but actually in kind of a more uh, uniquely sloppy way. Uh, and then of course hand stitch or overcast stitch up above once they stuck the canteen inside. Notwithstanding the sizable number of dark dyed uh, blue or gray or brown, uh, those colors are by far the most common for the Cincinnati Depot. Again, the dark dyed blue, gray or brown, again, by far the most common for the Cincinnati tin spouted canteen. So as far as the shoulder strap, the peculiar plain woven duck fabric was folded and sewn to make Cincinnati shoulder straps. This material is frail and generally uh, does not really stand uh, the test of time really well. In 1864, there are uh, many that were double stitched with a very famous brown thread that made it so unique to the Cincinnati Depot. So as far as Cincinnati shoulder straps, definitely look for that brown thread to set it apart.
The distinctive tin spouts known today as famous Cincinnati canteens were introduced in about that April 1863 era. For the first time, each of the four contracts left that month specified smooth-sided bodies in tin spouts. Until the end of the war, this would be the official Cincinnati canteen design. The reason for the change in metals has not been determined, but serious consideration is given to the theory that extremely poor soldering on early western canteens led to the adoption of the tin spout. No examples uh, from this first batch of the first 120,000 have been known to exist, although there are a few examples that might fit this criteria, but we're not sure. Either way, we don't know exactly why Cincinnati went to the tin spout of canteen. So that's it for the Cincinnati Depot canteen. We appreciate you guys watching this video. We appreciate you uh, participating in this episode. I know this is a very long episode, but again, those who subscribe to our channel, you know we're not in it for the three and five minute videos. We're here for the research and hopefully to make you guys better reenactors in addition to us as well. So please like us, please subscribe to us, and see you again on another episode of the 11th OVC.